And so let me uh, just introduce um, Jeff Roberts from our Colorado uh, Freedom of Information Coalition who is going to moderate this last panel. Very important panel when the, the committee was talking about uh, sessions for the summit, this idea of privatization being very challenging for a lot of people and just growing, growing concern uh, in terms of every, every month, I think on our listserv or whatever, we're seeing people posting questions around this topic. So we thought this would be a very uh, important one to bring up here and to close out the session with. So Jeff, let me let okay. you take it away. Thank you all for uh, sticking around for the very last panel of our conference. Um, really appreciate that. Uh, I'm Jeff Roberts from the Colorado Freedom of Information Coalition, and I want to introduce um, the rest of our of our panelists here. Uh, to my right is Miranda Spivak. She is the Pulliam Distinguished Visiting Professor of Journalism at DePaul University, also an independent journalist whose um, work appears in Reveal from the Center of Investigative Reporting uh, and in the New York Times. Her, her recent series called State Secrets, uh, which includes a lot of what we'll be d discussing this afternoon, uh, recently was honored with the Sunshine Award from the uh, Society of Professional Journalists, and she uh, used to be a reporter and editor at the Washington Post. Um, to Miranda's right is Kelly Shannon, who is the executive director of the Freedom of Information Foundation of Texas and uh, a longtime journalist. She worked for the Associated Press and the Dallas Morning News, among other news organizations. And she's also an adjunct per, uh, journalism instructor at the University of Texas uh, in Austin. John Williams is a TCOG board member and uh, an alumnus of the Vanderbilt Law School right here, um, and uh, has a diverse uh, law practice. Um, for our purposes, our interest, um, John represents the Nashville scene, which is a, an alternative weekly uh, in public records lawsuit issues. Um, also advises other publications that are owned by Southcom Communications. So we're going to be talking about transparency in government when a private entity is involved. And so uh, Dan mentioned privatization. That's uh, one. It can mean a lot of different things. It can mean you know, government contracts uh, with private vendors. Um, it could mean uh, nonprofits that, are, that use public resources to essentially perform governmental functions. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about um, public money that is used to uh, lure companies, lure, you know. So right now, there's a little company called Amazon that is uh, going to open a second headquarters someplace. And Denver is one of those places that's drooling over this. Some people don't like the idea, but the, all the, you know, the cities really want this. And uh, the Economic Development Council of Metro Denver is is uh, has is making an offer, but it's it's a super secret, and they've also asked um, uh, the municipalities to sign. Amazon has asked the municipalities that are making proposals to sign non-disclosure agreements. So, you know, I wouldn't mind touching on that a little bit as well. Um, but let's first talk about the trends that that you all are seeing. Do you want to go first, John? Miranda was going to go first. Oh, Miranda. Okay. We talked among ourselves. Okay. Um, I just want to show you a couple things while we're starting this discussion. One is just to show you the website for this series of stories. Two out of the five stories are really on the privatization of public information. Um, and the other is this database that we developed in conjunction with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel that's pretty interactive and that we're going to try to actually expand, but we'll also help you figure out, especially for civilians, not few of whom are in this room, I think, but uh, for people who are trying to get access to public records in your state. So I just uh, want to call that to your attention. Um, I, what I found was, you know, every government is outsourcing government functions now, whether it's the smallest little town having trash collection with a private company or, you know, big, big cities. Uh, creating police videos, but then not necessarily possessing the videos, because actually uh, Taser and whatever its successor company is, they pretty much control, you know, they, they are the re repository of the videos. 
So these issues are just bringing up, all, these trends are bringing up all kinds of problems and making it, frankly, very easy for governments to turn down requests for public information. Charter schools, which was mentioned earlier today, a lot of states have set up these private nonprofit entities to oversee the charter schools. Uh, Arizona is one of them. And then when people ask for information like salaries, as we were discussing earlier, even though there's their teachers being paid with public funds, they're denying uh, access to that kind of information. Charter schools, I think, are a big area, actually, where privatization is, is becoming a, a government, you know, access to information problem. Um, crime data that the police departments because they don't, I mean, this is partly because governments are way underfunded when it comes to IT. It's not a sexy topic to be a lawmaker to make your case that, oh, we're going to make our government more efficient with better software and hardware. But um, the, uh, the crime data is being outsourced to companies like LexisNexis, which get it for free from the, the police department. They do the mapping for the police department other uh, community groups and other competitors who want access to that uh, information to also map it and make it available more quickly, frankly, than the police departments are making it available. LexisNexis is saying, well, no, we own this. It's proprietary. Um, in DC, there was a case that I wrote about where a cyclist who was annoyed that people were parking, this is a first world problem, but parking in the, uh, you know, parking their cars or valet parking was happening in the bike lanes. but. It's an issue. Um, and he wanted to link to DC law on bikes and not blocking bike lanes and found out that the DC law was essentially, you couldn't link to it because that link was owned by uh, either LexisNexis or Westlaw. I, it, I can't remember which one it was. Um, there's a big case going on in Georgia right now about who owns the state laws. So all of this is these very kind of oddball things that you would not think are, are being retained by the private sector, but they are, and it's creating huge um, access problems. Um, another thing I ran into was water companies that are, are being no longer run by governments. Uh, there was a case in West Virginia where um, local activists wanted information about whether the local water company was prepared to deal with a chemical spill in Charleston. There had been one. And so they uh, were able to, the water company was able to claim everything was a trade secret, basically. And they redacted all kinds of information, including the 800 number of the State Public Service Commission, saying this was highly sensitive information. I mean, this is just sort of nuts, if you ask me. But trade secrets are probably, you know, it's being broadly used to, to keep this information uh, out of public view. So. Okay, well, this is a, a natural follow then to what Miranda was just talking about because in Texas, as I mentioned earlier today, we had a really rough legislative session and uh, a couple of our biggest initiatives were to try to change the law to correct something that the Texas Supreme Court had done and they did these two rulings in 2015 and y'all might remember I mentioned them last year. One's known as the Boeing ruling, one is known as the Greater Houston Partnership ruling. Um, and I'll talk more about the Boeing ruling because that's the one that we're seeing the most fallout from so far. But quickly, the Greater Houston Partnership ruling uh, deals with when basically traditional government services, economic development, and other types of services are farmed out to a nonprofit by the government. So the nonprofit's being supported by taxpayer money and it's doing traditional government services. It's not just some type of contract. but. Um, then used to we were able to get at those records and see what's happening with that nonprofit, but because of the Greater Houston Partnership ruling, we can't anymore. That was one of our main pieces of legislation. Sorry, I dropped my glasses. But the Boeing ruling, what it did, um, it, it, it put just hundreds so far, hundreds of government contracts off limits to the public, and, and it's just growing every single day. And what the ruling did is it said that, okay, in the past, the Public Information Act, there was a, an exemption, a bidding exemption, and in the past, it had always been interpreted by the Attorney General's office to apply just to governments who wanted to keep bidding information secret while the ongoing bidding situation was happening. Um, and it had already, always been very strictly interpreted that way. Well, what the Texas Supreme Court did is go against that interpretation and say, 
um, it, this can now be claimed by the third party, by the company that's doing any kind of bidding or having a contract with the government. So now the the companies, the Boeings of the world, but all kinds of other little companies now are saying we don't want that contract or information pertaining to that contract released to the public because that will put us at a competitive disadvantage in the future. So it's it's different than the trade secrets. We've always had the trade secrets exemption and still do and still would under our proposed legislation we had. But what this is is just about a competitive disadvantage and not a decisive disadvantage or significant disadvantage, but any disadvantage. So all a company doing business with the government has to say is, hey, I don't want that release. That'll somehow put me at a competitive disadvantage in the future. And the attorney general's office has its hands tied now and just in most cases has to rule and does rule that, yep, that's right, that information is off limits to the public. So. You know, we, we've couched it in a, in a very straightforward and accurate way, which is you, the public, the taxpayer, are not getting to see how your money's being spent. And um, in some cases, you can't even see the amount of money. We're not even talking about the details of the contract. Um, but it, it's um, the examples are, are many. As I've mentioned, we've had like some 600 rulings already through the Attorney General's office on this. Uh, but it has to do with like food service contracts at universities, bus uh, contracts, public schools, um, you know, the Boeing one was the first one that made it all happen. Um, you know, in, uh, insurance contracts uh, throughout the state. And now uh, the, one of the easiest to grasp examples is down in the lower Rio, Rio Grande Valley of Texas where the city of McAllen doesn't want to say how much it paid the singer Enrique Iglesias to sing at the holiday parade. Still to this day, that amount of taxpayer money has not been released, and the Boeing ruling lets them keep all that secret. And the government, in that case, is not releasing it and says, we might be at a competitive disadvantage in the future when we want to hire another entertainer for a holiday parade. So it's really a sad situation, and I can go into it more in a bit. But um, you know what has been one of the you know stronger open government laws in the country, and I and we still do have the provision of uh, an agency can't just deny information; they've got to get an attorney general's ruling giving them permission to withhold information. So that, in a sense, you know, keeps us in 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 strong standing. However, with holes like this being blasted into the Public Information Act, it's really just a mockery of its former self. So that was a major um, bill of ours that we tried to push this session. We ran, we had some business buy-in on it, but we ran into real strong opposition from big business and just businesses who, they're in the driver's seat anyway at the Texas Capitol. And now they're really in the driver's seat because they've got this Supreme Court ruling and they certainly don't want to see it changed. And they even got into committee hearings and testified to that fact. The Texas Association of Business says, um, no, well, we actually, we really like the way this ruling is and we just want to keep it this way. And, you know, some businesses will acknowledge, hey, we know if we're doing business with the government and using taxpayer money, there is a level of transparency that's expected. Um, but. But, but their business lobby just pretty well said, no, you know, we've got it the way we want, and this is how it's going to stay. And so we are hoping in 2019, excuse me, 2019 to change that. But we'll see. Um, this year at the Capitol, we had lots of distractions and lots of issues sucking the oxygen out of the building, like the transgender bathroom bill, the sanctuary cities bill, the school voucher bill. And, you know, we're thinking that if we don't have quite so much mayhem and distraction next time, maybe people really will focus in on this important issue, but we'll see with that business opposition, it's a tall order. So I'm curious though, leg some legislators, what do they say? If they're, on the one hand, they are they might be really concerned about reining in government spending, so how do they, you know, how do they justify this? What do they, when you ask them about that, what do, what do they say? Well, I mean, those that are on board with it, of course, you know, say, sure, we need to be able to see what the government's spending. We need to see how taxpayer money is spent. But the sad thing is there really wasn't much debate on it because, um, you know, it got quick approval in the Senate. And in the House, there was a committee hearing, but 
you know, it never even got a vote in the committee. So we didn't even get to see any House floor debate on this issue. It, it all got bottled up in, ironically, the Transparency Committee. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we had a legislator who chaired the Transparency Committee who just basically blocked all of the transparency bills. So that, we didn't get to hear the kind of debate. Now, we did, of course, work work the chambers and talk to legislators individually, and many of them were like, oh yeah, I'm on board, check me down on that. And the, the Boeing bill, you know, the Boeing fix bill, as we called it, had a lot of co-sponsors, so if people had really put their money where their mouth was and voted it, then I feel like it would have had some good support in the full house, but not in the transparency committee, and that's where they all stopped. Well, let's let's hear from John. So in uh, in Tennessee, uh, I guess the uh, there really hasn't been any legislative action as far as the application of the Public Records Act in Tennessee to um, private entities, and so it's really developed through um, court law, court made law, and um, there. But there have been a number of um, significant decisions beginning in 2002. So it's really been over a period of 15 years. And um, I've, I've got a PowerPoint that I've prepared. I, I think, I'm afraid it's an occupational um, hazard. I, I do this when I do um, continuing legal education programs. So I, I have a short PowerPoint that I think will illustrate um, kind of the diversity of types of entities um, that the courts have had to deal with the applicability of the Public Records Act to. Um, well, yeah, this one works. Let me give this one. Okay, so, um, so the, um, the first case in a sequence of cases over um, a 15 year period, the lawyer who represented the Memphis Commercial Appeal newspaper, which I promised um, Lucian Perry I've put in a plug for, that's his plot, and they brought a number of very significant public records cases over the years. It's the um, daily newspaper in Memphis. And so Lucian represented the Memphis Publishing Company um, in this case. And the um, Cherokee Children and Family Services Agency was a private nonprofit Tennessee corporation. Um, and it had a contract with the Tennessee Department of Human Services. And the function that it performed was it was sort of a brokering agency that received applications from low income, um, mainly women, that were looking for daycare services for their children. And it would, uh, the the function was to help to match up the families with um, child care um, providers. And so um, the Memphis Commercial, so there was a little scandal that developed with respect to this agency. And so the Memphis Commercial Appeal was um, developed, was investigating this scandal. And so the case made it all the way to the Tennessee Supreme Court in 2002. And so the first part of the, the holding is basically in the first bullet, that records made or received in connection with the transaction of official business by any governmental agency. So that's the general um, standard for what is a public record under Tennessee law. And so the Supreme Court said that um, that includes those records in the hands of any private entity which operates as the functional equivalent of a government agency. And that standard, by the way, was taken from the Connecticut Supreme Court. I don't, I don't know, if, is there anybody here from Connecticut? I guess not. Um, anyway, so there was a, a Connecticut Supreme Court decision that used that terminology, functional equivalent of a government agency. And so basically the Tennessee Supreme Court in this Cherokee, what's come to be known as the Cherokee case, kind of flushed out what that means and what the analysis is. And the Supreme Court said, you know, in every case that involves whether a private entity's records are to be made public, um, you look at the totality of the circumstances, everything that may be relevant. Um, and then the, the court said um, that there's three factors in particular that a court should look at. And so in all the subsequent cases, that's the way the Tennessee courts have analyzed whether a private entity was subject to the Public Records Act. The level of government funding of the entity, and in the Cherokee case, um, 
this private nonprofit corporation got almost all its funding from the Tennessee Department of Human Services. So that made it pretty easy to determine that it was subject to the Public Records Act. The extent of government involvement with, regulation of, or control over the entity, and that's also a pretty significant factor. And then the, this final factor, I think, is not so significant, whether the private entity was created by an act of the legislature. Uh, because if it was, then it's arguably always going to be subject to the Public Records Act. So I don't think that that last factor is very, very important. And so finally, the conclusion that the um, Tennessee court reached was that this um, brokering agency for daycare services was um, subject to the Public Records Act. Um, the next case, and this is, we'll, we'll see one more in the sequence of cases, and this is something I'm sure you all will run into in your states, and that is um, a private nonprofit that's concerned with economic development in the particular area. Um, and in this case, it involved um, a county called Cock County, which is a small county in East Tennessee. Newport is the um, county seat, and they had the city and the county kind of collaborated, and they, they set up this private nonprofit economic development entity. And it, it's interesting who was on the, on the board. There were some city officials, some county officials, and then there were representatives from a bank, a hospital, utility board, and of course, the Farm Bureau. Um, and so the um, trial court had held initially, and I think the trial court may have decided the case before the Cherokee decision of the Supreme Court. And so the, the trial court said, no, this um, organization is not subject to the Public Records Act. Well, it went to the Court of Appeals, and the Court of Appeals applied this functional equivalent analysis. Um, and said, we're going to send it back to the trial court, as appellate courts do, and let, let the trial court decide whether or not, under all the facts, it is the functional equivalent of a government agency. And so when it went back to the um, trial court, the trial court said that it was subject to the Public Records Act. So this um, next case um, was also kind of a, kind of a scandalous case. Um, there's a, there was a... Um, a, a, one of these arena football teams called the Nashville Cats. And so they had cheerleaders. And so um, the company that managed um, the facility in which um, this, uh, the arena football team played their games um, was Powers Management. And, and the interesting thing about this is it was a for-profit, <coughs> not a non-profit entity, a private for-profit entity. And it contracted to manage this um, facility. Uh, on behalf of the, the Sports Authority, which was a public nonprofit corporation. And so the scandal was that employees of um, Powers Management set up this videotaping equipment um, that was in the um, dressing room where the cheerleaders changed clothes. And so they were, you know, filming these cheerleaders, and that resulted in what was basically a tort um, case filed by the cheerleaders. And so, um, the court held that Powers acted as the functional equivalent of a government agency in the management of the arena and that its records were public records. And what was interesting was that one of the three judges on the Court of Appeals wrote a concurring opinion to try to provide some guidance, I think, for future um, cases. And that judge wrote that certain activities that have been traditionally viewed as governmental activities of state or local government um, and the, the judge mentioned things like policing, incarcerating, adjudicating, and educating as being traditional government activities. And so if a private entity is performing any of those things, then naturally they would be the functional equivalent of a government agency. And so the next case applied that principle because it was a case against the Corrections Corporation of America. Now they've changed their name recently because of all the bad publicity they were getting, and they're called Core City now, which how they came up with that, I don't know. But anyway, at the time of this case, it was um, CCA, and they were, they were managing um, facilities um, under contract with local governments, and so the Court of Appeals had no <coughs> trouble at all in finding that their records should be open under the Public Records Act, and the court even said that it was at a loss to, as to how operating a state prison could be considered anything less than a governmental function. So th the next case, and there's one more that we'll get to in a minute, um, that illustrate how 
not all private entities that do things on behalf of a government agency are going to be held to be subject to the Public Records Act in Tennessee. And so this was kind of an odd situation where the University of Tennessee Medical School, the College of Medicine, had, um, which is located in Memphis, had sort of a satellite facility in Chattanooga in the other part of the state. And this non private nonprofit foundation was set up that perform several functions, which are outlined here. Uh, record the hours during which the College of Medicine faculty members supervise residents at a local hospital in Chattanooga called Erlanger. Um, they, they handle the function of paying the faculty members for teaching services, and they build insurance companies and Medicare for these um, services that these members of the faculty that were public employees uh, provided. And it was about 30 to 50 percent of the total revenue of the foundation came from per performing these services. And so when the case got to the Tennessee Supreme Court, um, the Supreme Court applied the Cherokee factors and said not the functional equivalent of a government agency. And I think the key language um, was basically that the court found that the duties of that entity were ministerial. In a, in a subsequent case, they called them administrative. Um, so whenever the entity is performing what are essentially ministerial or administrative duties, um, they're probably, their records are not going to be subject to the Public Records Act. Now this is my case, and so I, I know this one inside and out. So this was a case against um, the, what we call in Tennessee the TSSAA, the Tennessee Secondary School Athletic Association. And it has about um, 400 high schools that belong, only 82% of which are public. The rest are private high schools. And they basically make rules, uh, they call bylaws, that regulate sports competition in, in a number of different sports among high schools, both public and private, um, in Tennessee. And they also sponsor the postseason um, uh, tournament games uh, which sort of determined the best teams in several different divisions, which are large schools and smaller schools. Um, and their budget is $5 million, only 2% of which comes from the dues paid by the high schools that belong. And so the majority of that money comes from the revenues from those tournament games, those postseason games that they sponsor every year. And the majority of their are almost all of the members of their governing bodies, their board of directors, are principals and superintendents from public high schools. And so a paper that is unfortunately now defunct called the City Paper, um, which was a daily um, paper, and it was also owned by Southcom Communications, which is the company that I've done work for. Um, they were investigating not a public school, but a private school, a private high school in Nashville and the, what they were investigating was financial aid being provided to students at that private high school for, for their participation in sports. And the, there were very strict regulations on that um, that the TSSAA had. So that was the focus of the investigation. And so the TSSAA, which is a very conservative organization, just said, no, nah, we're not, we're not going to show you any of our records. And so we, we had to file suit. And it was really interesting. We won the case in the, in, the, in the local court, the trial court, and then we won in the Court of Appeals. And then the Supreme Court decided not to hear the case. So, you know, in my opinion as a lawyer, speaking as objectively as I can, I think it's a case that could have gone either way. And so I was very pleased that we did both at the trial court level and at the Court of Appeals level, we did as well as we did. And so the, what the, the analysis was this, that the um, Basically, the, the decision-making officials of this entity were all, or, or the almost overwhelming majority, were you know, principals from, and assistant principals from public high schools. So they were public officials that were making all the rules and enforcing all the rules um, governing this sports competition. Also, the um, Tennessee Board of Education officially recognizes the TSSAA in its rules. It's the only entity that has anything to do with sports that's officially recognized in the, in the uh, rules of the Tennessee Board of Education. And then finally, they, they talked about the in, indirect government funding 
that came from the, the gross receipts from the tournament games at the end of the year, which was the overwhelming majority of their budget. And so these games were played in public venues, uh, actually college venues, um, MTSU in Murfreesboro and um, in Cookville, the Tennessee Tech facilities in Cookville. So all of those factors were the factors that the Court of Appeals used to find that the TSSAA is the functional equivalent of a government agency. And so um, the, um, the next year, um, and Frank Gibson, who's in the back, knows about this, they, the TSSAA made an effort to exempt their records from the Tennessee Public Records Act after this court decision. And um, they, believe it or not, this um, you know private entity, which claims to not be subject to the Public Records Act, they have lobbyists at the Tennessee legislature, so they pay attention to what's going on at the legislature. Always have had lobbyists for many years and, and did in 2015, the year after the Court of Appeals decision. And so their lobbyists got busy and got a bill introduced that was in an effort to exempt um, their records from the Public Records Act. And Frank and I met with their lobbyists and there were other people involved. And, um, Basically, what came out of it was what I consider to be a pretty innocuous exemption. And what was really, really humorous to me was that the TSSAA lobbyists realized during the course of the discussion of this legislation that the records, that the school records um, of the uh, academic performance, financial status, um, medical or psychological treatment or testing, those records of the students that they said were so sensitive, how did the TSSAA have access to that information? And they thought, oh my God, maybe we don't. And so the language that they got written into the um, act exempted that kind, those kind of records from, which I think probably would have been exempted under federal law anyway, um, but also gave them access to it or said that they, they, would, they had the ability to get it that information from the schools. So it was kind of humorous, and I don't think it did any harm to the court decision holding it off. Unfortunately, this is another case that the Memphis Commercial Appeal uh, brought recently. The city of Memphis <coughs> was hiring a new director of their police department, and they uh, entered into a, an agreement with an organization called the International Association of Chiefs of Police, <coughs> which apparently performs kind of a search function um, for um, police departments and maybe other types of departments um, to um, help them to screen applicants for that type of a position. And so they performed that function. And what they did was to narrow um, a long list of applicants to six applicants, which they then provided to the city of Memphis. And the city of Memphis made that information public about those six final applicants. But they refused to make any of the other information about all the other applicants um, public. And so the newspaper tried to get it from this private um, entity, and um, they refused to provide it. And so um, the, the court held that the, um, this International Association of Chiefs of Police is not the functional equivalent of a government agency, and they applied the, the Cherokee, Cherokee test again. And here's where they use the language administrative. They said that this organization performed the essentially administrative task of conducting a preliminary search and delivering a non-binding list of recommended candidates to the city. Um, and that really the city was the, um, and that they, they made the information that was requested of them public. Um, and so, um, anyway, and the only less than one percent of their revenue was um, derived from this executive search service that they provide. And then finally, one more very recent case, last um, couple weeks, um, again involving another economic development nonprofit, um, private nonprofit entity. And so, in this case, Jefferson County, which incidentally is just like right up the road from Cobb County, the other one that um, involved in economic development. Um, and so again, this was um, an organization set up as a nonprofit public benefit corporation. It had um, half the members were public officials. And the, the uh, mission, as stated in its charter, was to coordinate 
the strategic economic development efforts of Jefferson County and the public entities therein. And the Court of Appeals had no trouble in saying that is a governmental function. Um, the local governments contributed more than 60% of the funds that they receive each year. And so the court said the expenditure of taxpayer revenues can fairly be said to be a governmental function. Um, so I think, you know, economic development entities, my conclusion is that they are generally going to be found to be subject to the Public Records Act. Um, entities that perform more of a bookkeeping, administrative type um, function, um, ministerial was another term they used, are probably not going to be found to be um, the functional equivalent of the government agencies. <coughs> so this is just what we've seen in Tennessee with still no legislation. The Tennessee legislature hadn't taken up um, this issue. And so um, I think it's just going to continue to be decided on a kind of a case-by-case -case, um, basis, but with some pretty good case law to, to back us up. Yeah, and I wonder if in a lot of states there just isn't a lot of clarity on these issues at all, because either because they haven't been litigated or there's no, it's not clear in state law. In, in Colorado, I'm thinking of, we have um, 20 nonprofits called community center boards, which coordinate services for people with developmental disabilities. These are private nonprofits, but they receive anywhere from 80 to 92 percent of their funding from public dollars. And so they're performing, in my mind, they're performing a governmental service. There's no other, you know, they're taking public dollars to, to coordinate these services. And they are not covered by the open records law. You know, they claim they're not covered by it. We don't have any direct litigation uh, about that type of thing. And so there was actually a bill in the legislature a couple of years ago to cover them by under the open records law. And something passed that, you know, required them to post their budgets, you know, something really pretty innocuous. But nonprofits in general freaked out about that. You know, are we going to be covered as well? We, we have one case that I can think of. Uh, the Denver Post sued uh, what's known as Stapleton Development Corporation, which is um, when the airport moved many years ago. This is on the land of the former airport. It's now big residential development. And it was a nonprofit created by the city of Denver to oversee development in this area. And they claimed they were not covered by CORA, the Colorado Open Records Act. And the Denver Post won that case, and it went to the Colorado Supreme Court. So that's the test. And I think it, I think it says something about being an agency or an instrumentality of, of the public body that, you know, that created it. Do they have contr some control over it? That's kind of the test in there. But, Nobody's applied that to these community center boards or you know these other types of entities, and so you're just left hanging, wondering if they're covered. And if they claim they're not covered, they're essentially not covered, because no, unless somebody sues. Oh, oh, I wanted to add something too. Um, the thing that was so disappointing about that Greater Houston Partnership case in Texas, and there's a couple of handouts floating around in case you want to see some of the bullet points, um, is there had been this, you know case it was called the Neelan test and it had come out of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals back in the late 80s and that's what had always been used in Texas to test whether a nonprofit receiving taxpayer money was subject to the Public Information Act and and it had just been floating along all these decades and this is how it, everyone understood this is the test we're using and this Texas Supreme Court ruling undid the Neyland test and uh, and you'll see in the handout it, it has a lot of similar pr provisions of this functional equivalent test that you're talking about um, slightly different but same premise and that's what we were trying to do with our greater Houston partnership fix legislation in at the Capitol this year is to try to restore that Neyland test and oh, did, did people come out of the woodwork? We were privy to a lot of these backroom meetings with the different stakeholders, um, and people just came out of the woodworks. So, you know, different nonprofits that were all of a sudden worried, we're going to be called, a, you know, a government agency. Um, we're the booster club of the Dripping Springs High School Band. No, you know, it, it just think about think about what the test is. You know, and we it, it, there, it was endless debate, not on the floor of the Senate or House, but in the back rooms. And 
anyway, it, and it's interesting that Neyland test came out of a case. It was named for a news director in Texas at a television station, and um, and it had to do with the NCAA. So another sports case. <laughs> peel off sort of another side of this too, which is that when the government confers somehow, confers a benefit, and that's gonna happen with Amazon actually, but in um, there's a case right now in California where uh, the, go the Los Angeles Transit uh, uh, Agency gave a contract to a company that promised to create local jobs, pay you know the prevailing wage, um, and do other things, and that tipped them into getting the contract. Those were the extra points that they got for getting the contract. And now there's a, a union organization that wants to get the data to see if, in fact, they did comply with the contract, and the company is, has intervened. It's sort of part of what we talked about earlier. You know, they're a third-party intervener in this case between the city and the union, um, and they don't want the information given out because they say it's a trade secret. So it's sort of another another side of this, you know, where the government is conferring some kind of advantage. Uh, I mean, and it's a government conferred advantage. So I have a question for you guys about trade secrets. What What is a trade secret? Be could it be anything they say it is? And do we, do we have any any way to verify that without taking them to court. Uh, it just seems like it's used quite a bit. I think that there, um, there are some lawyers in the audience, I see Paul here, that may want to chime in on this. But basically, um, there, most states have a trade secret statute <clears throat> that has a definition of the term trade secret. So I would think that would be the best way to kind of separate the wheat from the chaff. Yeah, but it's being, <clears throat> the problem is it's being widely used, and the governments are not really doing much to stop it. In fact, every state that I looked at, except Massachusetts, which deals with it in a different way, every 49 out of 50 states have it have it as an exemption. Yeah. Hmm. And, and I'd like to add, in Texas, uh, part of the complaint of companies is that the trade secret provision, the exemption in the Public Information Act, was being applied so strictly and narrowly by the Attorney General's office that they told us in a lot of these meetings, in these stakeholder meetings, we can never get anything called a trade secret. So now that this Boeing ruling has happened, we're all jumping in on that and going in in that direction. And that's one reason we are so adamant about wanting to keep that Boeing exemption, because it lets us put a lot of records off limits that ordinarily they might have tried to have gotten in on the trade secrets, but our Attorney General's office kept it very narrowly construed. So, you know, I guess as you say, a state-by-state -state basis is how it's interpreted. Well, well it would seem to me that um, if there's a trade secrets exemption in the Public Records Act and there's no definition of trade secrets in the Public Records Act, you could still go to the State Trade Secrets Act and you, because there, I guarantee you there will be a definition of trade secrets there, and there may be some case law interpreting yeah. it. it so. It's generally, I think, defined, um, but one of the other problems that I ran into as I was looking at this is that um, most of these government entities, when confronted with the question of what is a trade secret, turns to the company and right. says, what is a trade secret? You can do the redacting. And that's why, for example, in this West Virginia case, somehow they managed to redact the 800 number of the State Public Service Commission. You know, why they thought that was a trade secret. I mean, that just showed how reckless they were in, in the redaction. But the redacting opportunity is given to the company. So b before we go to questions, um, I want to get back to Amazon for a second. And, and Amazon asking uh, municipalities, uh, government entities, to sign non-disclosure agreements about what they're proposing to lure the company. Can can they get away with that? No, I don't think so. I mean, it, the law is going to overrule any type of agreement. You know, a local government or a state government can't enter into an agreement promising to keep something confidential if the Public Records Act says that it's open and available. Right. right. Yeah, I had this discussion with uh, the editor of the Denver Business Journal on the phone the other day because that's that's what they're trying to do, and the, e the economic, economic development corporations are staying silent about this stuff. The municipalities aren't talking about it, so he's making a bunch of records requests, and but they're also keeping the um, non-disclosure agreement itself from the public. So what's in that? Wow. One, one comment um, before we start with questions. 
when, when I was doing this um, Tennessee Secondary School Athletic Association case, obviously I was interested to see if there were any other similar organizations, because every state has one of these high school athletic associations. So I did some legal research, and there, I found <clears throat> only one um, Supreme Court decision from another state, and it happened to be from Michigan. And it had been, I don't know, 10, 10 years or so before um, the case that I was involved in. And the Michigan Supreme Court had held that the, um, it was exactly like my case. It was a public records case. And the Michigan Supreme Court had held that they were not um, subject to the Michigan Public Records Act. And of course, there were some differences in wording, but not significant between the two public records acts. Two Supreme Courts reached completely different decisions. And just out of curiosity, I was recently looking to see if um, the decision in, in my case had been cited by any other courts to see if maybe the issue had come up in another state. And sure enough, it had come up in Illinois this year. And in Illinois, the Illinois Supreme Court held not subject to the Public Records Act. And it was very, very interesting. And they, they actually cited the decision of the Tennessee Court of Appeals and then distinguished it by saying, well, the difference is that in Tennessee, the Tennessee Board of Education officially recognizes the TSSAA. And, and that was the single factor that seemed to make a difference in, the, you know, in their analysis and why the Illinois Supreme Court said not subject to the Public Records Act. So it's very frustrating and hard to know how courts are going to reach a decision you know, interpreting a statute on this type of issue. Questions? I just want to add on the redaction issue. We, we came across this where the companies were in, in bid contracts were allowed to redact whatever they wanted, including uh, the name of the CEO. And basically, we shamed them. And we also filed a complaint with the Public Information Board. The, the governor's office decided to change as a result uh, without there being any kind of ruling involved. But that involved the. Our Medicaid, state Medicaid, has gone over privatization in the last couple of years. So we have three managed care organizations where it's a, you know, it's a big black hole trying to get information from them or the state. Are there any either rulings or, or other things out there about you know, what a managed care organization and whether they're subject to open records law? That, that is a great question. And I'm going to refer to anybody from Tennessee. Frank, do you, do you know if that has come up with any of the 10 care managed care organizations? Uh, I'm not aware that it has. Tennessee is also very big into um, managed care for their Medicaid program called TENCARE, T-E-N-N, care. And uh, they rely very heavily on those several private um, entities. And I, I just have not heard that that issue's come up. More of a just a note encompassing everything you've talked about and for everybody to get an idea how bad I think things are really coming in this regard. In Illinois, we have intergovernmental agreements and we uncovered a huge scandal that tied to Texas in Region 4 School District. And when we submitted our FOIAs to the school district, a Tennessee company intervened and appealed to the Attorney General, ended up redacting a massive amounts of information claiming trade secrets and they did it with an attorney out of Washington, D.C. And we know that they're circumventing bid requirements in Illinois through intergovernmental agreements through the venue of capitalizing on what Texas has. And Texas school district gets a piece of the pie for every contract that the, gets done in Illinois. Are you talking about the Boeing, the Boeing situation? Well, they use the Boeing argument, but this deals with a purchasing cooperative for school districts and AstroTurf. basic services of you know public entity, uh, these contracts are being kept off limits like you know school bus contracts food yeah this, service this was an astroturf contract and they completely yeah. exempted everything oh and this is amazing so in other words they're getting texas in on it in in a piece of it so that they can then use that provision yes ma'am hmm. circumventing both the bidding and the disclosure of where all the money trails going 
You know, I just wonder, uh, I want to throw this out, that if you are trying to make an argument against this, whether you can talk about public safety and public health as part of the argument that the public should be entitled to have this information, apart from spending public dollars. Well, let me make another argument. And, and um, I mean, Kelly, thank you for bringing to light this truly appalling trend that the, the standard is competitive uh, disadvantage. Um, it, you know, a lot of bidding and, and contracting law, um, I mean, contracting is, is uh, open to the public to see, not so much uh, out of this uh, idea that we need to have good government or open government, but because other companies want to know whether they're competing. So I want you to help me understand how, just give us another layer of understanding this. Why, why wouldn't business be the number one <laughs> on the front row saying, no, we, we, want, right. we, we, want to have, we want to understand what our competitors are doing, especially when you're coming up with public money on contracts? Well, here's what happened in Texas, and we did get buy-in from some smaller businesses and mid-sized businesses, and I went and spoke to this uh, group of tech companies that are kind of more of the mid-sized tech companies who they want to break in and get the procurement, get the bid bidding that the big guys get, like that IBMs or Apples or whoever. So if you do get that buy-in, it's important, and they understand that, and they say, hey, if we can't see the winning bids, how do we know next time how to do a, a bid that might be the winning bid, which gives government a better bang for its buck, right? Well, the law firms, too, because they, they love to sue. You know, uh, right. in, I mean, in Louisiana, they do. If someone gets a contract, someone usually sues if it's a, a contract worth anything. Um, so you would think that they would have a stake in it, too. I'm just su well, I, surprised that business would, would not figure this out. Uh, especially on major companies. Well, some of them have figured it out, but I don't think it's the major companies. That's uh, that's where I think our wall was was with the very big, the Boeing's of the world, um, IBM, Apple. You know, I'm not saying I have proof on Apple necessarily, but I'm just throwing it out there because that's one of those big tech companies. Well, um, a lot of them already have the contracts. And they don't necessarily want these mid-sized guys coming in. So it's in their interest. And we do know that the big, heavy lobby came from the major, large businesses. And they're very close with our leaders of our state government. And in fact, you can look at, I'm not going to go into a, a whole lot of detail on this, but you know, uh, you know, s uh, certain leaders of the chambers of our two houses at, at the Capitol are connected back in their hometowns with on their local chambers, members of these big companies like Boeing are on their chamber board of directors. You see what I'm saying? So, and like, you know, if you look on the sheet I handed around there, you know, there's a small uh, business woman in East Texas who just wanted to see the winning bids of the Lone Star Community College for the temporary services contract. And she says, you know, I'm, I have a reputable business. I'd like to break into that market. How can I, you know, see these bids, and of course they cited the Boeing ruling and would not show her the contracts, would not show her the winning contracts. So um, th for those in power who already have the, the bids, who have the contracts, it works to their advantage to keep it now as it is under this Supreme Court ruling. You would think so, but uh, you know the way business, the big business, controls the Texas Capitol. That's what we're up against. And you know, if any of you have other ideas outside of this format to talk to me about how we can find common ground or make more appeals, we've got to find a way to work with the big businesses on this. Because if we don't find some way, you know, it's just not going to pass again because they really do control the Texas Capitol and always have big, big business controls the Texas Capitol. So, but I agree, business in many cases wants the contracts to be open. Kelly, just to follow up to that, um, did you say early on that NFI, NFIB um, did not want the change either? <laughs> It was the Texas Association of Business I was referring to. I'd have to look up how NFIB stood on it. But Texas Association of Business is the very big business lobby in Texas. And um, as I also mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different moving parts in the background of all of this. But we had the 
The transgender bathroom bill this year that was a very, very divisive thing at the Capitol did not pass. But the Speaker of the House, you know, was determined that this is not going to pass. And that was one of his biggest orders of business, right? And the Texas Association of Business was very much uh, in in favor of his position. And they said, we don't want to cost businesses and sports teams and everything from coming to Texas. It's a business argument as much as it is a human rights argument, right? So you had all these business, big business groups aligned with the leadership in the House on that issue. And you also had some of these big business groups aligned against us on the Boeing issue. We still don't necessarily, we're ne we can't really connect the dots on that, but we just know that that's what was occupying so much, you know, the, the, con the divisive issues were occupying so much of the time with the, the leadership of the House that we felt like our issues got kind of caught up and we were collateral damage too. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense, but those very organizations were aligned in certain ways on other issues. Yeah. Um, we've seen a couple situations in Ohio on this um, trade secret thing where they're even redacting the fee that they're receiving. And uh, I just got a call the other day, Kent State University uh, has a new food service contract. And the newspaper wants to see what Aramark is getting. And they got this blacked out contract. And so even if you concede that there could be trade secret exemptions and some of the details of their services, although it's way overboard. Uh, you know, what, are you seeing that? Like, how, how can you redact the fee? Now, there's other ways to get those disbursements ultimately, but you still don't know if that's tied to the fee. So what, what's, what's the experience there and the best way to fight that on the trade secret grounds? I, I would go back. I, I'm sure Ohio probably has a trade secrets um, oh, statute. We, yeah. And have you looked at the definition of trade secret in that statute? Yeah, it's been a while, and we, we should do that. Yeah. I would think that would be the best way to, because I can't imagine that the, you know, the, the bid of a private company for a government contract would be a trade secret. I mean, a yeah. trade secret is you, generally has to do with right. some process or right. method or something well, for which a patent yeah. has been solved. Yeah, we think that's ridiculous. And one, I, one idea you guys just gave me was, I'm going to tell the editor up there, uh, find out who else bid on the contract against Aramark, and they might be interested in uh, you know that. Because I, for, I think the point about other potential bidders would want to know that and other details right. so they can bid and, and theoretically save the taxpayers you know, more money um, the next time. But that strikes me as being an issue that's easily worth going to court over. I mean, yeah, that, and, and I just, think they will. That's a sure win. I hope so. Yeah. That's what I told them. Thanks. There's a question in the back. Grab this one here, and I'll be right over there. I thought I'd mention something along those lines with the trade secrets. I mean, trade secrets are, I've seen them be often abused, and they're asserted by companies, and I've seen the government say, well, just redact what you want. But trade secret law, generally, they have to have like certain security measures, making sure that it stays secret, and they have to have a competitive advantage in the marketplace if it is actually revealed. Maybe that second piece might be arguable, but the first piece, it seems to me, once they submit the bid to the government, they actually are no longer controlling it, other than maybe to assert, hey, we think it's a trade secret. So maybe on that security piece, you may actually have an argument, which that security piece is in probably, it's in the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, which most states either have or have a version that's similar to. So just a thought. Um, a competitive disadvantage standard is um, kind of frightening, uh, but it's also playing out at uh, at the level of state economic development agencies. You know that they can't disclose what deals they want to make with a automobile manufacturer, and so if they're kind of trying to adjust uh, open records laws uh, and other applicable statutes to kind of conform to enable them to protect the negotiations that they're uh, making with that, then I can see that spilling over into everything else. And I don't know whether you've encountered that uh, kind of issue elsewhere or whether the, the concept of, um, you know, like, well, we're competing with Tennessee 
for this car plant and we're competing so we can't disclose we don't want to disclose what our offer is you know in the old days some Times we were able to fight back with that because a lot of those economic development things, particularly in Georgia, weren't necessarily the best economic development things, you know. So, if, and you could get people roused up if um, the consequence of that secrecy was that um, that they got a state prison in their backyard or they got something a Superfund site in their backyard, you know. Then then they might want to know about it. Um, but uh, I'm much more concerned about big business and leveraging state economic development agencies for, um, and then what the ultimate effect of that is going to be on other um, entities. You know, I think this Amazon thing is going to be a, a really interesting case in point because I think the states are going to bend over backwards to try to get it, and they're going to enter into all kinds of agreements, and, oh, if they don't happen to be legal or comply with state records law, well, we'll deal with that later because, of course, as we know, the penalties for failure to comply are, like, negligible in most states. So, you know, I think, I think that that's may be a really good, interesting test case to see. I mean, I don't see states saying, oh, no, uh, we're not going to enter into this non-disclosure agreement with you. I mean, because if, if you refuse to do that, I'm sure Amazon will immediately take you out of the running. Yes. I don't know if that really answers your question. Thank you. I work in Knoxville. and. Uh, over there, most of the economic development projects that we get, uh, that uh, the large ones that come with incentives, uh, also have an incentive package from TVA. You know, not just the locals, not just the states, but a separate TVA package. Of course, TVA is this kind of weird hybrid. You know, not exactly federal, not exactly state, not exactly public or private. And TVA, as a rule, has consistently refused to release their incentives. You know, they 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 have they have a time or two for some odd reason, but as a general rule, it's it's simply stonewalling. Uh, do you, uh, we've tried to challenge that a time or two, but had little luck. Do you have any suggestions for how to tackle getting TVA incentives? Well, I, unfortunately, first of all, I think that probably TVA is going to be subject to the, to FOIA and not to the state public records act. They they would certainly assert that, and I, I suspect they would prevail on that. So I, I don't know off the top of my head what exemption they're claiming under FOIA, but um, w you'd have to look at that and just see what the case law is on that it, the exemption that they're claiming. You know, uh, in the changes actually in the FOIA law last year, I wish Tom Sussman were still here because he really knows about this, but there, there was a loosening and an opening up on federal contracts that makes it, it could be a good example for a lot of the states. So it could be that there might be something about the contracting, if you look at the most recent changes in the law, that could work this time. That might not have worked a year or two ago. Yeah, but if it's, if it's built into the contract, you might be able to get it now. So I, I have more of an anecdote than a, than a question, but I thought I'd share it because it, comes, it ties together a lot of these issues. So in, in New York, um, the, the governor has a lot of these large economic development projects that he's uh, very fond of doing. And we have, a, I think, a pretty unique provision in New York State where the comptroller can actually review contracts before they're executed. And I think there's only two states in the, in the country that have that. So to avoid, seemingly to avoid that uh, level of review, he started to uh, take the economic development projects and have them be bid out through these not-for-profits that were affiliated with the state university system. Uh, at the same time, our city university system also had not-for-profits that they were using to supplement activities of the university. So we actually uh, foiled the different um, universities just to get a sense of how many not-for-profit affiliates they had that were doing government functions. And the information we got back for SUNY, which is the state university system in New York, we, we got several hundred different not-for-profit affiliates that were carrying out some kind of government function. Um, and we did, haven't gotten the ones for CUNY yet, but we suspect that those are also several hundred. 
Um, and it turned out later uh, with SUNY that there was a bid rigging scandal. There were nine indictments of the contracts that were bid out through these less transparent, less accountable uh, not-for-profits. And of course, reporters started to then foil the not-for-profits associated with SUNY that, that did the uh, contracting. They claimed that they were not uh, subject to FOIA. Um, and then what followed was uh, a bill introduced in the legislature that we uh, advocated for that would clarify that they were. They ultimately decided that they would voluntarily comply with the FOIA requests, and so that's where things stand uh, currently. But we really feel like uh, you know the, the bigger issue here is with the economic development subsidies and the transparency is just that there are so many of these entities and more and more government work is going out to them that we're kind of always on the defensive, even if we get them to comply with the, with the law. Do you know if there's any case law in New York? Because that sounds to me exactly like the, uh, what a functional equivalent is. Do, do you know if there's any case law? I, I, I'd have to check. Like Bob Freeman's our expert there, and I know there's been some uh, case law, and, and we believe based on that case law that SUNY was subject to FOIA, which I think is why they ultimately voluntarily complied. Uh, and it's a lot of the same factors that you mentioned for Tennessee. But um, I think you know part of the issue is just there's so many of these not-for-profit affiliates that uh, maybe they're not aware or they're just not following them. And it's hard for groups like us to, and reporters to even keep track. Right. It sure sounds like a winnable case, though, for the function they're performing. Right. Um, I appreciate you pointing to trade secrets. Um, in Illinois, believe it or not, amongst many things, they list financial data, period. So we all know what that means. Just having that phrase, financial data, the price of the contract and anything financial data related to it is a trade secret. We can't get our hands on any of it. Um, well, we're going to keep working, and I uh, would anyone who has ideas for us in Texas on how to combat this unfortunate situation, I'd like to follow up on the Illinois getting the piece of the Afro astroturf <laughs> contract business because that's something I didn't know about. But you know, we just you know we can't give up, and uh, it's sooner or later. I think when we have more time in Texas to let it sink in, that's why we're going to work really hard over the interim to make it something that's important to everybody, not just a few of us advocates in Austin, but once it really sinks in that, hey guys, you taxpayers, you're not able to see how your money is being spent, and we make that message loud and clear, maybe, and we get the right buy-in from business on this, especially the competitors, then I, you know, we may stand a chance. That's, that's my hopeful message. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. All right. Yeah, thank, thank you. you all very much.